On the 4th of May 1970, at the Kent State University, members of the Ohio National Guard opened fire on students protesting the Vietnam War. Enraged that the conflict was to spread further into Cambodia and with no end in sight, anti-war protesters erupted around the United States. But at Kent State, four students were shot and killed, and two of them had nothing to even do with the protests. Nine more were seriously wounded. In response to the shooting, millions more took part in a series of protests, not only against the Vietnam War, but also in solidarity with those who were killed. It is perhaps helpful to start with the situation in respect of the Vietnam War by 1970. The United States had been involved in the Vietnam War for around five years, having lost almost 50,000 soldiers at this point. There were some student demonstrations in 1966 when the draft policy changed so that the students in the bottom half of their classes would not benefit from a deferral to be called up to the fight. Some protests centred on the role of Dow chemicals and their production of napalm, a weapon synonymous with the conflict. In 1969, the first draft lottery since the Second World War was called. This happened despite Richard Nixon's campaign promise just the year before that the draft would be ended once and for all. Opposition to the war only grew when massacres carried out by the American forces came to light, such as at My Lai. The Tet Offensive showed that the Communist forces were far from defeated and were able to launch massive attacks around the country. Many young people resented the idea of being involved in such a war, but the catalyst for much of the protests would be the decision to invade parts of Cambodia in April of 1970. This was seen as a determination to not only continue the war, but to escalate it into a neutral country. Kent State University was no stranger to anti-war protests, even before the full-scale involvement of the United States in Vietnam. In 1964, a small group of Kent State students engaged in peaceful protests, fearing that American involvement was imminent. Such demonstrations were often met with violence by other students, being shot with air rifles. The Students of the Democratic Society, or the SDS, a left-wing activist group, led a number of protests in the late 1960s. One of their key demands was the abolition of the Reserve Officer Training Corps, or the ROTC program. This program was offered at Kent State University and produced commissioned officers. Clashes with the police would lead to the Kent State University chapter of the SDS to be banned at the campus. When rumours began circulating that the United States was to invade Cambodia, student protests began. For many, they had grown up with parents affected by the horrors of the Second World War and the Korean War. Many hoped that the Vietnam War would not have the same impact on them. On the 30th of April 1970, President Nixon announced that the United States forces were to cross the border into Cambodia, where Viet Cong forces were seeking sanctuary. The very next day, student protests across the United States erupted. On the 1st of May 1970, at Kent State University, an anti-war protest was held on the Commons, a large grassy open space in the middle of the campus. It was led by a group of history graduate students, a group named the World Historians Opposed to Racism and Exploitation. In a symbolic act, students buried a copy of the United States Constitution to highlight that Congress had not yet declared war. It was attended by some 500 or so students who decided that another protest would take place on Monday the 4th of May. The event was peaceful during the day, but at night violence began. It is however disputed as to just why the violence started. It is often stated that drunken students threw bottles at police cars and broke a few windows, and that the police were heavy-handed in their response to the vandalism. Matters would escalate dramatically with bonfires lit in the street. The entire Kent police force, along with police officers from neighbouring counties, were summoned to deal with the students. The mayor of Kent, Leroy Satram, then announced a state of emergency. Tear gas was used to disperse the students, and 15 were arrested. On the 2nd of May, the mayor asked the governor of Ohio, James Rhodes, to deploy the National Guard to help subdue the situation. 
Whilst some business owners were threatened by students to show support of the anti-war protests, plenty of students helped to clean up the damage. Rumours abounded that all manner of radicals were hell-bent on destroying buildings and businesses. Likewise, sightings of a number of officer cadet students near the ROTC building led to rumours of the National Guard already on campus in response to the previous night's events. But one persistent rumour was that the ROTC building, the Army Recruitment Office and the Post Office were to be destroyed. The mayor banned the sale of alcohol and set up a curfew in the town, in hopes of avoiding a repeat of the previous night's violence. More police officers were called in to deal with any potential unrest, but there was to be no limit on peaceful organising or rallies on the university campus. But at around 5pm, the mayor made a call to request the deployment of the National Guard. By around 7pm, a group of students had gathered in the middle of the campus, unable to enter the town and growing restless. The crowd grew and ultimately made their way to the ROTC building, an old World War II era wooden structure. Stones were thrown before the building was set alight with a railway flare and gasoline. Whilst only a dozen or so students took part in the arson, many more watched. Attempts to put out the fire were met with some students damaging the equipment brought by the fire brigade, using a pickaxe and machete to cut the hose. Eventually, the local police arrived in riot gear and dispersed the students with tear gas. When the National Guard arrived late that night, they too were met with stones thrown by students. Throughout the night, a small shed and information booths were set alight. The curfew was ignored as bonfires were built in the roads of the town. It is since suspected that the destruction of the ROTC building was pre-planned, as flares, a pickaxe and a machete are not items one typically brings to a peaceful demonstration. It is also thought that those who carried out the arson were not students at the university and only sought to agitate the situation. On the morning of the 3rd of May, Governor Rhodes issued a statement to the press. He stated that the students were worse than the brown shirts of Nazi Germany and worse than communists. Rhodes doubled down stating, We are going to eradicate the problem. We are not going to treat the symptoms. Many looked to Rhodes as inflaming the situation to benefit his upcoming election bid to the United States Senate. Rhodes indicated that he intended to enact a state of emergency, though this was never followed through. Nevertheless, National Guard officers and university faculty took this to mean no gatherings of any sort. Aside from a few students visiting the remains of the ROTC building, the day was largely uneventful, but at around 8pm, a peaceful gathering at the Commons was starting to form. By around 9pm, the students were ordered to disperse. Tear gas was again used by the police without any violence carried out by the students, but students sought to make their way to the university president to demand that the National Guard be removed from the campus for amnesty for those students arrested and for the abolition of the ROTC. However, no such meeting between the students and the president would take place. Instead, students were told that the mayor was coming to address the demonstrators. Again, Mayor Satram was not permitted to address the crowd, and the colonel in charge of the National Guard read out the Riot Act, stating a curfew was now in place. It was at this point that the students, feeling that they had been slighted and misled by authorities, turned hostile. Stones were thrown at the National Guardsmen, with three being injured. With the use of tear gas and a helicopter, the students were driven back to their dormitories. Some students attempted to break into the nearby Rockwell Memorial Library, with one student reportedly bayoneted. 51 students were arrested on this night for breaching curfew. Going into Monday the 4th of May, the students had grown even more resentful of the National Guard. Not only was there a military presence in response to an anti-war protest, but they were seen to have prevented discussion between the authorities and the students. As for the guardsmen, they had little in the way of sleep, having an average of only three hours. By 8am, a number of classes had been cancelled following a bomb threat. Word spread around campus that another demonstration was to take place at 12 noon. 
It was thought by the faculty and the authorities that such a protest would be permitted by the National Guard. By 11am, a number of students had started to gather in the commons, some to protest, some to watch, and some just going about their day. Some students found themselves unable to move freely around the campus due to the presence of the guard, and so, they joined the rally with little other option. But by 11.45am, some 500 students were on the commons, and according to those in command of the National Guard that day, posed no threat and were peaceful. The National Guard sought to disperse a group gathering near the ruins of the ROTC building, with weapons locked and loaded, meaning a bullet in the chamber, and prepared to fire. Rocks started to be thrown, and anti-war chants drowned out the demand. Brigadier General Robert Canterbury ordered some 100 guardsmen to form a skirmish line, with weapons locked and loaded, with bayonets fixed, and gas masks on. By 12 noon, there were around 1,000 students present. The goal of the skirmish line was to disperse the crowd, though this authority to carry out such an action was subject to controversy. Canterbury would go on to state that he derived his authority to disperse the crowd based on Governor Rhodes' proclamation or the Riot Act. As the line moved forward through the crowd, a number of tear gas grenades were fired, though these fell short and were in turn thrown back by the students. Some of the grenades would end up affecting the students not taking part, but merely spectating the events. As guardsmen marched through the commons, the students fled, but as time went by, many students became united in their fury, and they regrouped. The students acted in solidarity and chanted, Pigs off campus. As the students threw rocks, some were beaten by officers with batons when they refused to drop the projectiles. Some students ended up in a parking lot, and it was reported that this group were throwing a large number of stones. The guardsmen took up a kneeling position on the football field, and pointed their weapons at the students in the parking lot. After ten minutes, Canterbury ordered his guardsmen to retrace their steps back, feeling that the crowd had suitably dispersed and incorrectly believing his men had used all of their tear gas. It was expected that the soldiers would head back to the burned ROTC building, and that the danger posed to the students had passed. Some students even got within a few feet of the guardsmen, shouting and jeering, though the instances of stone throwing had lessened. Canterbury would later say, As the troop formation reached the area near Taylor Hall, the mob, which was located on the right in front of Taylor Hall and in the parking lot, charged our right flank. They were throwing rocks, yelling obscenities, and threatening, kill the pigs, stick the pigs. The attitude of the crowd at this point was menacing and vicious. I felt that, in the view of the extreme danger to the troops at this point, that they were justified in firing. As the guardsmen reached the top of the Taylor Hill, they opened fire on the students following them. There was no verbal warning given by the guardsmen when they were about to open fire. The officers in charge asserted that they gave no orders to fire. What is asserted is that a single shot was heard, followed by a volley of shots. Around 67 shots were fired from pistols, rifles, and a shotgun. Some asserted they fired only into the air, whilst some said they shot into the crowd. In all, four students were killed, their names being Jeffrey Miller, Alison Krauss, William Schroeder, and Sandra Lee Scheuer. Nine more were wounded, including one student named Dean, left permanently paralyzed from the chest down. The closest students shot were between 20 and 40 feet from the guardsmen, and many more were shot far further away, some being struck by ricochet. Of those who were killed and injured, the role they played in the protest varied greatly. William Schroeder was an ROTC cadet who had not taken part in the protest. Jeffrey Miller was seen throwing back tear gas grenades. Alison Krauss and Sandra Lee Scheuer were on their way to class, or spectating some distance away when they were killed. After the shootings, both students and guardsmen attempted to administer first aid to the dead and injured, but enraged students forced the guardsmen to retreat further, 
firing tear gas as they left. Orders were given for no more firing unless instructed to do so by an officer. Upon seeing their students dead, some faculty members who had previously acted as marshals to the protests sought to avoid any further bloodshed. Some spoke to their students of how the guardsmen were terrified kids, that the situation had escalated and needed to calm. One professor, Glenn W. Frank, successfully stopped a group of guardsmen from dispersing a group of grief-ridden students by insisting that they would have to go over his dead body. Within an hour of the shooting, the dead and injured had been taken away and the commons was cleared. The reason for the shooting is not entirely clear. Some point to a suspected sniper on a university building taking a shot at the guardsmen, though an FBI investigation found no evidence of such a claim. Others assert they feared for their lives when students raced up the hill following the retreating guardsmen. Others asserted they did not fear for their lives but opened fire as they thought they had been ordered to do so by their comrades already shooting. As the guardsmen were seen to have shot in self-defense, there was no criminal action brought against them. However, a civil suit filed in 1979 by the injured Kent State students and their families resulted in a settlement of $675,000. Since the massacre, riot control tactics of the National Guard have changed, using rubber bullets and other less lethal weapons. The aftermath of the shooting was profound. Photographs of the dead and injured soon emerged, notably taken by journalism student John Philo. It showed a woman by the name of Mary Ann screaming as she crouches near the dead body of Jeffrey Miller. The photograph won a Pulitzer Prize in 1971, and became one of the key images of the anti-war movement. Hundreds of other universities staged their own protests and walkouts in response to the shooting. Over four million students took part in nationwide strikes, but Nixon's government attempted to frame the students as waging a civil war and not as anti-war protesters. There are even a number of theories about the shooting, notably a role played by an FBI student informant named Terry Norman, who was the only person other than the guardsman known to have been armed at the protests. Only 11 days after the Kent State shooting, students at the historically black Jackson State University were shot and killed by police whilst protesting. 100 or so students had protested the war and the shooting for two nights before being shot at, although there was little to no outrage at these killings. As for the general public, many placed the blame solely with the students and not with the guardsmen. The anti-war movement was largely seen as unpatriotic. In New York, what were dubbed the Had Hat Riots saw construction workers and office workers who saw themselves as patriotic clashed violently with student protesters that they saw as unpatriotic. Whilst the protest started out as an anti-war rally, it soon became more about the opposition to the National Guard presence. For those already opposed to the war, it was a tangible symbol of the military system that they fought against. For others, the Guard was seen as an invader, stopping all peaceful activity and prepared to use tear gas against non-compliance. One officer present noted that he felt the students were viewing the Guardsmen as one would view the circus as something not to be taken seriously and couldn't possibly present any real danger. But just why the guardsmen were ordered to lock and load their rifles, prepared to fire against unarmed students will forever be a question as to why such an action was proportionate. Just why were the soldiers ordered to march through the crowd of students that would reform as they moved on, resulting in the guardsmen being surrounded will be another as it clearly inflamed the situation and did not disperse the crowd. The right to protest is a key component of a functioning democratic nation. The fury of a generation was stamped to be stamped out. The divisions it brought to light have continued and the justification for violence carried out by the state against protesters will remain a topic discussed again and again. But the shooting at Kent State University showed that even relatively affluent students in the Midwest of the United States could be caught up in such violence, whether they were taking part or simply going about their day.